Warning. Please plug your headphones before proceeding further. This video contains abusive languages. Welcome to the Classical Chambers original audiobook stories, where we present stories like crime, horror, fiction, adventure, etc. Today's story, A Night in New York, written by Trisha Basu. It is a fictional representation of the crime world based on 1965. It was 1965 when Sam visited New York, one of the busiest cities of America. A city that never sleeps, where people are just busy fulfilling their dreams, making money, going to pubs, drinking, selling drugs, having sex, prostitutions, gambling. It seemed as a city full of life. But as years passed, Sam realized it's just a land of chaos. He is 25 years old, middle class man and a struggling musician who left Africa to become an artist, who learned about United States of America by the word of mouth, the land of dreams where people can achieve anything if they were just passionate and worked hard for it. But for Sam, it has been totally a reciprocal of what he heard. He had been working hard over the years, but couldn't achieve what he was dreaming. Sam lived a poor life. Over there, being a black, he was suppressed, humiliated and racially abused by everyone sometimes tortured by the notorious and mischievous white boys. As night was rolling down, he was looking at the picture of his and George, a copy of which George kept by himself in his wallet before he was to leave for United States. Sitting by the window pane, lighting a cigar, he was thinking about his childhood friend. George and the time they used to spend together in a small town in Africa. Those were the best days, he murmured. Both of them had the dream of becoming rich and successful. And at the age of 14, both of them dreamed that one day they will fly to United States of America. The thought of their separation was engulfing him like anything that night. So that night, near about 10.30 pm, he went to one of the nearest pubs and drank a lot of gin. He was almost out of his senses, behaving like a drunkard and was getting emotional. Hiding his tears, somehow he managed to get back home by midnight. Next morning, after waking up, he was still suffering from the previous night's hangover. He received a call and the husky and a bit cracked voice that he heard over the phone was totally mysterious to him. Before Sam speaks, the call ends. He kept the receiver, removed his blanket and took a hot water bath. And standing under the shower, he tried to recall exactly what happened to yesterday night. After freshening up, for the time being he was not thinking about the phone call that he received this morning, Sam's inner self was being demolished over here. He was feeling claustrophobic, so anyhow was trying to contact George because he had nothing to hold to in such a big city. It's becoming an impossible task for him 
to stay over here and even failed to contact George. Sam muttered, I think he has changed his number. It has been years that they are not in touch. George had departed at the age of 19. After landing in the United States, George faced the same problem that Sam was going through, facing all kinds of discrimination and running out of money. Sam felt frustrated and depressed. He almost locked himself up in his room. The clock was ticking and sharp at 7 p.m. Sam reached Madison Square Garden. It was a windy evening. The place was not that crowded. There he met a well-dressed man. Seems to be quite rich, huh? Sam said himself, and the man replied, Did you say something? Sam replied, No! <laughs> you look scared, huh? Don't you worry. Let's sit and talk. Sam, nodding his head with such hesitation, neither seemed like a yes or a no. And the suited man begins to introduce himself. Now listen, Blackie. My name is Ricky Dash. I am a drug dealer. Yesterday I saw you at the pub. You looked stressed out and depressed. So you drank and smoked a lot. You were almost out of your senses. So you didn't notice me. But I was sitting just next to you. I heard you were saying to yourself that you are a failure in this American dream and couldn't achieve what you wanted to. You were haplessly hopeless, right? It was me and my men who dropped you back to your home. And in the meanwhile, we have managed to collect a lot of information regarding you. Who are you? Where have you come from? What are you doing over here? Even I came to know that you are broke and you need money. Is it true, buddy? Sam replied in a confused state with all his frustrations, anger, fear and hesitation. Yeah, but I don't want to take the wrong path, you know. See, there is nothing wrong in the United States. If you make money, you rule, bro. Otherwise, you are just a rat. People gonna f***ing kill you. You own your part and then you can leave my company. If you want, what I want right now is your desperation. And this desperation is very much needed to achieve what you want and earn a position for yourself. You help me grow, I help you grow. You will become one of the greatest musicians ever in the United States. Their conversation continued for an hour and at last, Ricky Dash said, If you try to be over smart, I'm gonna kick you ass. Sam, with a petrified look, replied, Hmm. And thereby decided to join him. That night, while walking down the streets of Madison Square, he saw George with a girl entering in one of the costliest hotels over there. He wished to talk with him, but he couldn't because of his own back draws and he was not in a state of mind to talk to him. The whites who passed by him was abusing him. He felt like committing suicide by diving in front of a bus. But somehow, he boosted himself up and he was happy that George had achieved what he wanted to. So he went back home. From the next day, Sam began to work with Ricky Dash with all the hatred he had developed for his life and the people over there. He started 
to sell drugs and smuggle goods for him and earned his commission. This way, he started to earn a lot and he finally became delighted and addicted to his brush merging game of life and forget his dreams of becoming a great musician. Sam even started to kill people, sleep around with girls, took drugs. He became extremely notorious and abysmal. He lost all his simplicity, purity and everything good in him. Though he earned Ricky Dash trusts and finally they become partners. By now, Sam had earned a lot of money, position and reputation. Now he had many workers working under him. He never ever had a feeling like this before. Now he enjoys this nefarious feeling and screams and howls in an empty room. Now I am the master of white and I'm gonna show them who I am. I'm gonna kick their ass. Ricky Dash and Sam had gained a lot of ground. They destroyed all of their rivals and now the only rival of Dash was John Ryder about whom Sam was totally unaware. They took a day to celebrate their hooliganism in their great white mansion which they had built out of somebody else's blood. On the next morning, Ricky Dash unpacks his final motive in front of Sam. He says, Over the days, we have achieved many things. But for now, I tell you, we have to kill John Ryder. He is a gangster who is right now leading New York. He worked hard to earn that position. He has a lot of establishments over here. He had also done good for people. If we kill him by concealing ourselves, we are going to rule New York. And nobody would know who was behind this tragedy. That night, after the conversation, they started to celebrate Sam's success. Sam was too happy and delighted, but somewhere in his mind, he was now thinking to meet George, his childhood friend. But before meeting him, he also wanted to re-establish himself as a musician and leave Ricky Dash company. Years after came the final night, the night in which they are gonna kill John Ryder. And Sam will free himself from Ricky Dash's company. It was for the first time that Sam looked a bit shaky and nervous. He said to Ricky, It won't be easy for us to kill John Ryder. If somehow he gets to know about our plan, whatever we have earned till now we will lose and we will be completely destroyed. We will be killed like those dirty fucking rats. Ricky replied with an ease. Easy, easy. Don't you worry, Sam. Our people are always keeping an eye on him. I got the information that today he is gonna leave New York by airways. When he leaves for the airport, one of our men is going to smash him down. It was 7 p.m. when George left for the airport and he was smashed by a truck on the highway. The car's bonnet was crumpled, the glasses were broken and shattered all over the places. The car rolled twice and John Ryder was lying upside down from his car, drenched in blood. After getting the news of John Ryder's death, Ricky Dash and Sam started to celebrate their victories. And the man who killed took all the money John Ryder was carrying with himself, his gold chain and even his wallet. He brought back those things and placed it in front of Ricky Dash and Sam. Sam took the wallet and threw the money on the man's face who 
killed John Ryder and threw his cigarette on the ground, rubbed it with his boot and set his pistol and shoot. And shoots Ricky Dash and the man. Suddenly, the room soaked in silence. And few minutes later, with the roaring thunder and lightning, it started to rain. It started to rain heavily and tears rolled down his blood-stained face as he looked at the picture in the wallet. The picture of him and George. Now he stands all alone, broken, and blank near the window of his great white mansion, staring at the black and spearing night. I've lived a life that's full I traveled each and every highway and more much more than this I did it my